Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and we have Jonathan Gray on at least twice a month. Last month we had a uh, special. We had actually Jonathan on three times. Today we're up to chapter number 29, is it? Not 29, yes. 29. And, uh, the rest the, rejected. That is the uh, forbidden secret. You can get it at before us, B E F O R E U S dot com. Uh, you're an amazing researcher and believer, and of course, it's important that I tell people to keep their skepticals on. A real believer is like a Thomas that asks tough questions, wants real answers, and once they do, they accept the truth and they move with it. They don't just stand on it, they actually do something with the truth. And that's what you've done, is you've actually been a skeptic who who drove away your own skepticism by doing proper research. For all those people out there that think they know better, you just need to read Jonathan's books on ancient archaeology, and you realize that the truth has been screaming at us from the stars and from ancient history uh, for many years, but it's been purposely suppressed by the dark side, by people who want to keep us in a state of ignorance. So uh, let's talk about Chapter 29. What's this all about? This is all about a rescue promise made, promise of pardon. Uh, the, the time has come, the stage is set. The creator of the universe is about to depart for a little planet eaten up with problems called Earth. Well, we know what planet that is. We're right here on it, aren't we? Right. He lays his majesty aside. He steps down out of the heavenly domain onto this dark, lonely planet of tears to teach us and show us what he is like to rescue us and to restore relations with us. Then can you believe that, Bill? The creator himself, who controls every atom, is coming to this rebel planet to die for the hostages. The creator of everything, who existed through all eternity, coming to live as a mortal and among mortals and then die for them so that they might have life unending. Now, that's nothing less than godlike, is it? Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, only God could have accomplished this, and which means, uh, as opposed to so-called Islam, Jesus did not come as a man who knew about God. He came as God who wanted to know more about man. God in the flesh, that's right. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I recall something which I, is one of my favorite uh, stories from the past, and that's about Sir Isaac Newton when he was a little boy. Uh, one day he was out in the garden watching some ants, and in his enthusiasm he accidentally trod on an ant and squashed it. Well, this little boy ran crying into the house, and as his mother pulled him close and wiped his tears, Isaac looked up into her face and sobbed. I did not mean to kill it, Mum. I love that little ant. And the mother, of course, said, of course you did. Well, he said, those ants would never know how much I love them unless I became an ant and could speak their language. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I think that's so beautiful. And yeah. you and I, like those ants, how better could we understand our Creator's love for us than if he stepped down, took human form, and suffered with us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's funny, funny, I've given a similar story about uh, Jesus. It was, it was like becoming an ant like us in order to, to literally show us the way. That's why the first three centuries the church was called the way. It wasn't called Christianity. That was actually a blasphemy by Domitian, the emperor at the time, that actually said they're little Christians or little anointed ones, and so I'm going to throw these anointed ones to the lions at the Circus Maximus and the other theaters of death that they had across the Roman Empire. So the real issue is that we are followers of the way. And Jesus showed us a way back to the Father, to literally to fuse our soul, which is mortal, to the immortal spirit that literally makes us exist. So we become a new creature. And he showed us that way. People don't understand. It's not just, quote, going to church. It's being. It's not doing. The doing comes out of the being. But the being is accepting God as your master, your Lord and Savior, your actual, the very center of what you are. And uh, why did they reject him? It just doesn't make sense. What happened? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, here he descends to earth, he assumes our nature to reconcile us to God and to obtain a never-ending life for us. I mean, just, you can't think of anything more precious. And how has he been received? He's been shunned for his voluntary poverty, despised for his humble human parentage, hated for his goodness, and tried before law courts for crimes unknown to him. Now, very, very few 
people on earth when he came had the slightest idea that their long-awaited Messiah, they were waiting for the Messiah, but they had hardly any idea that he was coming to them in such a humble guise. And yet the prophecies did actually indicate that. And uh, so we came down to our level and where our first parents had failed, as every one of us has, he goes over the same ground to be tried and tested every way we are and prove that one could win over Satan's power. Now, he proved that man connected with his maker could live victoriously. And then the beauty of it is that he would offer credit to each person for what he did. He would credit to them his perfect life and he would die the sin punishment that each of us deserved so that we on death row could be pardoned and ultimately rescued. But it's very important to realize that only one who's not fallen under the serpent's power, under Satan's power, could take upon himself that penalty and secure our pardon. And only someone equal to the law could actually provide pardon for our having broken it. And, uh, you know, we might be, somebody listening today might begin with a mind unfavorable to Yeshua, Jesus, but as you read through the historical report, say, in the Gospel of Matthew, instead of finding him to be a charlatan seeking glory for himself, you find him to be a warm, a powerful, a caring, a forgiving person who went about teaching and healing and giving of himself for the people. So, so why would they want to reject that? It's an, it's an in interesting question. Most definitely. Uh, yeah, Isaiah predicted that he, and Jesus himself uh, publicly announced that he was fulfilling this prophecy. Isaiah said he would come to bind the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, comfort all who mourn, bestow on them the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And he actually announced those words as his first public address, and the Gospel of Luke records that event. I remember um, uh, passing a shop one time, a shop front downtown, and uh, in the window of the repair shop was this sign, everything mended except broken hearts. I thought that was <laughs> rather good. Yeah, that's uh, also a little bit of tongue-in-cheek humor there, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, and that's something what you and I can't do. We can't mend broken hearts. But that would be the Messiah's specialty. Yeah, in fact, uh, that's why people that seek any other form of peace except with the Prince of Peace, it's always false. It can never be real. That's right. Absolutely right. In other words, you don't have a political system. Jesus could have come as a great politician like Obama. But he didn't. He came to transform hearts. He says, when your hearts is, are transformed, now the kingdom is. Not when you defeat the Roman uh, centurions or the, lo the local Roman emperors or King Herod, who's their proxy. It's when you defeat the demons in your own heart, when you learn how to follow the pathway of God, when you learn how to forgive, when you not only forgive others, but you forgive yourself by following God. Uh, I think true forgiveness is actually changing your pathway. And the reason that people rejected him was primarily they didn't want to change, did they? No, they didn't want to change. Yet confronted with this kind of Messiah, one for whom all history had been preparing, you'd expect the world to flock to his feet. Uh, yeah. But the prophecy said that would not happen. Interesting. Um, yeah. Tell some of these stories because you've got some great stories in your book. Okay. The rejection of the true Messiah was prophesied in Isaiah, in Daniel, and the Psalms. And the prophecies, these prophecies were actually acknowledged by the early Jews to be messianic. And they indicated that he would be rejected by the very people who foretold his coming. Uh, for example, let me read the, the three of these. The, this is in Isaiah 49, 7. The Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation of Israel abhorreth. Isn't that interesting? That's predicted. Yes. Yeah. Then Isaiah says again, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. Psalm says he's despised of the people. So there we have the prophecies uh, warning the people that he would be despised and rejected. Exactly. Welcome back to the New 
with your medical report. And uh, please continue. This is an amazing story. And people should realize this is not, how can I say, this is a part of the continuum of all knowledge. If you don't have the spirit portion of the knowledge, and I talked to Dr. Apsley earlier this morning, who has a, what I call a cosmic view of what a true believer is. You, if you don't understand these truths, you're going to be a victim. And victimhood is not something we want you to go through, whether it's physically to see your health deteriorate financially or especially spiritually because the spiritual minefields around the world are going to get much more intense. And what God's really saying is, will you see me in the clouds of the storms coming? Will you see me in the fire? Will you see me in the beauty of the world? But will you also see me in every way I talk to you to repent and to turn back to me? And uh, people don't understand, whether it's nations or people, that without God, our world is doomed. We will not be saved by technology, uh, medicine, genetics, or scalar atomic technologies, or harnessing the power, as Mishukaku says, of the stars, or the black hole at the center of the galaxy, or the cosmos itself. We will only have peace when we actually stop rejecting Jesus, that the ancient Hebrews did, and the Jews of the first century, many, by the way, didn't reject him. One of them was my ancestor in the first century. And you need to understand that right now, even within the church, they don't really want to fully accept Jesus as being Lord over their life. They have what I call easy believism Christianity, or they have a lot of what I call false dogma that puts them where they have to have a proxy between them and God, or they don't take the responsibility. And I think the worst reason why these people didn't want to accept Jesus, they didn't want to change. It's like talking to a drug addict or a cigarette smoker. They didn't want to change. It's not that they didn't see the truth about the, the Messiah. They just didn't want to change, so they didn't want to accept the truth. Yeah, that's absolutely right. It wasn't lack of evidence. That was not the problem. Right, tons of evidence. I mean, the Jewish scholars themselves, and a number of times they even had messianic scriptures that you've pointed out before that they've actually cut out of the Jewish rabbinical writings and told you they even pronounced curses against those who would accept the the, the, the canon of, of the Torah writings and the Old Testament the, uh, that the Jews had considered right from the greater gods through his prophets they even pronounced curses over even believing these things because they knew they even set dates that's what's amazing yeah the, 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 fact, the fact that they accepted them until he came and then they rejected them after he came in rejecting him they rejected those scriptures and cut them out well, that's why Israel is now a couple trembling. That's why it's a fire pot among sheaves. That's why when we talked to David Rubin, who was the former mayor of Shiloh in the hour of hour one today, why Israel now is being forced with the Oslo Accord toward the the covenant with death that's talked about in, in Jeremiah and Isaiah. It's there. I mean, this is not maybe conjecture. This is literally God speaking from his eternal book, the Bible, and saying through his prophets, Seek me and you'll find me, but if you don't, you're going to face destruction. And not just the state of Israel, but the whole planet. We are marching toward Armageddon. And this is not a negative thing. This is the greatest grace secondary to the grace that Jesus came, is to get people to wake up and realize, without the Prince of Peace in our hearts, we will destroy ourselves. That's a reality, not a theory. Yeah. This is a cold reality, just like the reality of atomic physics, or electronics, or uh, you know, static electricity, or a lightning bolt, or the chemistry of hydrofluoric acid that can dissolve your bones. It's just the way it is. Okay. We, we had a look at a few minutes ago at the, some of the prophecies that stated the Messiah would be rejected by the very people that foretold his coming. But the prophecies also indicated that he would be accepted by others. Yes. Isaiah, uh, who wrote about his rejection, said that kings shall see and arise, princes shall also worship. Uh, he, he said, so shall he sprinkle many nations, and kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall consider. Right. So here we have the knowledge of the coming Messiah. Uh, when he came, his own people didn't want him. And we've just raised the question, why did the nation's leaders reject this person? And uh, we made a comment, uh, both of us, that it wasn't lack of evidence. That was not the problem. Right. Now, 
From contemporary accounts, we can uncover at least ten reasons why they rejected him. Now, do we need the whole ten, or shall we just quickly go through them? Let's go through them. Okay. Firstly, they were biased against him, because the human heart, according to Scripture, is self-deceived and corrupted by wrongdoing. We're all naturally rebellious against spiritual laws. Secondly, it hurt their national pride. Uh, the Jewish leaders rejected Jesus because he did not fit their mistaken assumptions, because he did not come in the power and glory of a king to overthrow Roman rule. Thirdly, his humble way of life offended their snobbery. Fourthly, he had not been taught by them. You know, it's the same today. They were unhappy with this brilliant young teacher because he had not attended one of their schools. He was in no way a product of their teaching. He was independent of them, and that hurts some people who are in charge. Well, it's the same way to read now, whether it's government, law, law school, PhD programs, or medical school. Uh, if someone brilliant came up with ideas that would transform the nature of health or wellness or even economic systems, they'd reject him out of hand because he, quote, wasn't taught by them. Yeah, absolutely. But that's a, uh, yeah, it's a very big, important point. That's a very important point, and it's very rampant today, absolutely. Uh, the fifth point is character showed them up. When you consider Jesus' compassion, it stood out in bold contrast to the pharisaical, rigid, uncaring attitude. His, his big-hearted love made their littleness look so small, and so frustrated and angry, they came to hate him for that. Well, one of the chief points that I remember in the scripture was where he healed on the Sabbath. And they were ready to actually condemn him for doing that alone. Just saying, they didn't argue with the fact that he had healed, but he had healed on the Sabbath? And yeah. God said, I, and he literally said, Jesus, Jesus said, uh, man is, is, made, is not made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath is made for man. It's made to be a day of blessing. Right. In other words, it's a day to, re to rest in God and, uh, and to realize not just the one day of the week, and I try to teach this over and over again, the Sabbath is for every day. You rest in God. The Sabbath is to know that God's there for you, whether you're dying of cancer, or you've been bankrupt, your family's left you, you're now devastated in a nation that's destroyed, you're starving to death, that God's there with you in that fire of tribulation, and that you have to enter that Sabbath that transcends the physical disaster you're facing, the emotional disaster, in order to really know the peace of the Most High God. You can't know that peace, and in fact, that peace will literally pull you out of that disaster if it's God's will. Yeah, absolutely. The, the sixth reason, Dr. Bill, why I believe uh, he uh, was rejected, he outclassed those leaders in, in argument. Now, you think of these. These learned men asked him one difficult question after another. They were determined to trap him into saying something that they could condemn him for. Right. Yet his mind was so keen that it was more than a match for them. Right. And he silenced one ta attack and then another attack after another until his enemies gnashed their teeth and retreated. Exactly. Uh, and often he had a, a way of telling little stories and in their response they condemned themselves before they realized they were the culprit in the story. Oh my. Back in a moment with some examples. And we're up to point number seven in this remarkable book, chapter 29, The Forbidden Secret, beforeus.com. And uh, I tell people they need to learn what are not only the, what we call the physical wisdom of the body, of uh, what real economies are, but God teaches the economy of the spirit. And uh, in point number seven, let's continue with these amazing points. Uh, there's ten points. Uh, his growing popularity endangered their influence. Expand on that. Yes. Uh, the fact that Jesus healed uh, made him very, very popular with the people. And to go with that, he had a warm, loving, caring personality, and this brought the, the people to him like magnets. The religious leaders were thoroughly alarmed by this. They saw people more and more coming under his influence, and their own influence, because of their hard, uh, relentless, persecuting character to the people, uh, they, they were losing control of the people's affections. And this, of course, was a big danger in their minds. Right. The eighth point was they feared incurring the wrath of Rome. Uh, 
uh, there'd been about a dozen rebellions in the land uh, since about 63 BC when Rome took over, and most of these were subdued by Roman force. And they feared that another uprising under Jesus might bleed Rome's patience dry and lead to a tighter control of the country. So for political reasons, Jesus was seen as a menace, Dr. Bill. Yeah, exactly. In other words, they saw him as a geopolitical menace, mainly because it was actually uh, emptying their gold coffers of their gold coins and so on that the Romans were using to pay their centurions and their and their armies. And they're, uh, they're worried about their bank accounts, basically. Yeah, oh, they were. Yeah. yeah. Now, now these, 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 six, these first eight reasons, I'll, I'll just go over them again, were actually uh, reasons why the leadership of Israel rejected him. One, they were biased against him, but by their own self-deceived hearts. Two, it hurt their national pride. Three, his humble way of life offended their snobbery. Four, he had not been taught by them. Five, his character showed them up. Six, in argument, he outclassed them, and that made them furious. Seven, his growing popularity endangered their influence. And eight, they feared incurring the wrath of Rome. Now, the, the other two reasons uh, could be applied to the nation in general, why the nation itself rejected him, not just the leaders, the ordinary people as well. Uh, this ninth point is very, very uh, pointed in the scriptures. They were asked by Jesus to leave the majority who couldn't care what, how they lived and follow an insignificant little group who were very much attached to him and to a new way of life. And Jesus said, Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there go in there at. Narrow is the way that leads to life eternal, and few there be that find. Now, sadly, I find, and it, it surprised me, the more I get to know human nature and, and interact with people, it's a sad fact of life today that truth is rejected, not because it's, it's wrong, but because of peer pressure. And history shows that despite this, the majority is generally found to be wrong. In just about every issue in history that you can point at, the majority is, is never normally right. It's a few who grasp the truth and run with it, and they become unpopular. Yeah, it's always true, isn't it? And it seems actually becoming more of a problem lately uh, in the transformation of what I call the Luke 21 mindset of uh, modern people that deal with things like Facebook and LinkedIn and uh, groupthink and uh, anti-logic and this idea of I, I, I have a right to my opinion even if it's not based on reality or facts. It's very weird. It's not even, it's not even logical. It's almost like there's a disconnect with, with logic and common sense and that it's a groupthink thing that actually has infiltrated the, the mental body politic. So what we have is people that, that don't even have the common sense of a child. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They've got the intelligence, but not the not the common sense, and not the what what shall we say? Not the discernment or the wisdom. It, it, yeah, it's, it's no, it, use, it, no use having intelligence if you don't have wisdom from God. Right. Yeah, it's very very strange. It's it's hard to even to, to put a finger on it exactly, but it appears to be to me a, a spiritual darkness. It's almost like the uh, Revelation saying, you know, that the, that those who can do, will do evil will continue to do evil, and those who do good will do good. It's almost like uh, God is saying, okay, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm, my spirit's starting to withdraw from you. Uh, you only have a, a limited number of days, weeks, and years before you'll be so ultimately dark and evil, you will call good evil and evil good. Yeah, yeah, and it's around us. It's happening. It's, oh, yeah. it's always been true, and today it's more than ever in any time in history. Well, we have, uh, just to you know, categorize, we have a current mindset. We have right now a Sunni Muslim president who is a eugenicist and an abortion advocate who wants to think he's some kind of messi messianic figure that's going to bring peace to the earth and save the planet from global warming and oceans rising. We have a, a secular pluralism that believes that all pathways lead to the Creator and there is no such thing as retribution or destruction, not only of us personally, but of our nation. It's very bizarre. It doesn't even follow any logic of, that the, even the ancient peoples would know that would allow a kingdom to list, last more than 200 years. It's uh, against the historical evidence and the contemporary evidence. 
Yeah, it just doesn't even make sense. It's like if you knew any history, you'd realize you can't go, you can't have a ship out in the ocean without a rudder uh, or with a sailor sail or an engine to get you through the, the pathways of the storm. You're just blown around in every direction. But yet people think they can do that, and then they often call it academia. They often say that their opinions are based on common sense when really it's an opinion that defies logic. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so let's continue. Uh, number 10. Yeah, number 10. They were asked by Jesus to forsake all and follow me. Now, in those days, the result would be to lose your job, lose your former friends, and perhaps even lose your life. So to accept his claims was not an easy matter. It meant that there was a lot of rethinking to do. And if you want to know why they rejected Jesus, you only have to look around today and see why people reject him now. It hurts our pride to think that we're sinners in need of a saviour. And we, as you said earlier, Dr. Bill, we don't like to change. People like to stay as they are. And, and this is wrapped up in forsaking our present situation and following him. Acceptance requires not a superficial change on the surface, but a total transformation of the person's life. Yeah, people often ask me, they said, how do you pray, Dr. Deagle? I said, how do you live? Every moment of your day, every thought and everything you decide should be like uh, Joseph said, you know, when he was uh, being pursued by Potiphar's wife, and you mentioned this earlier, he said, I'm not sinning against Potiphar and Potiphar's wife. I'm sinning against my creator. Yeah, what an insight. What, a, what, a what an insight, you see. Yeah, people don't understand that. You cannot sin against man. Man has fallen. You can only sin against God. That's true. Okay, so it all comes down to a mindset that blocks the evidence. Now, the evidence might be conclusive, it might be overwhelming, it might be irresistible, but if it doesn't produce conviction, uh, it, it's useless. Uh, the will and the affection have to enter into the situation. And as we often say it's about the mind and the heart, if, if, if you've got it in your mind, uh, that may not be sufficient unless it's also in your heart. And men have committed themselves to assert, I find this with people who, who, uh, who come out with strange ideas and I confront them and they, I can, you can see that they're convinced, but they dig in their heels because they've committed themselves to a certain position. Uh, it's very difficult for them to regard that evidence impartially, and especially when private interests are involved. When I talk about private interests, I mean reputation, job, uh, whatever. People who publicly commit themselves to a position and then find they're wrong, it's almost impossible for them to admit that to anybody well, because well, the public's looking at them. Well, have a look at the, uh, the body politic of evidence that's taught in what I call the secular agnostic schools around the world in sociology, political science, and psychology that teach us that we're an advanced, highly evolved slime that has group behavior that can be quantified by psychologists and social sociobiologists, and yet does not understand the real roots of evil. And then we have these so-called philosophers from Nietzsche, etc., that commit suicide and try to tell them it's a great truth. Welcome back, and uh, yeah, the interesting, uh, remarkable. The thing I love about your books, uh, Jonathan, is you wrote historical fact, common sense, and spiritual logic, and you use metaphors like Jesus did to try to explain people to change their mindsets so they can change their mind. Because you can't teach people, even with the facts, unless you get them to change their perspective, and they have to realize just how foolish they've been and how wrong they've been by just seeing a different perspective of the truth. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I, I feel a great responsibility like you do, Bill. Um, it is very precious people out there. You can't right. help but love them all. Like, it's not the person well, that we're there, talking about. We're talking about this this deception that's been thrown over them that we're just trying to well, uncover so that I mean, they can I mean, enjoy life. Well, my name in Hebrew uh, that was given to me directly by Jesus is called Slayer of the Dragon, Keeper of the Way. And it's real simple. God has shown me, beyond all the so-called religion and exposure to the truth and the blasphemous apostasies, even within the Christian church, and he's given me the simple facts. For example, the marriage supper of the Lamb occurs when you're dead, but the marriage occurs now. 
if you're not married to God, as it says, no one is given to in marriage uh, when you die. The reason is, if you aren't married now here on earth to God, why would you be married in heaven? Uh, it's like people say, well, I'm a pretty good person. I don't think, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of an agnostic. Uh, I sort of believe in Jesus. I think he's a cool guy. I think he, he, he think I'm probably a pretty good person. He wouldn't quote, throw me in hell. First off, God never puts anybody in hell. They jump into it like an open cauldron. If you don't have the ticket, it's because you weren't married here on earth. You didn't listen to Jesus. You didn't consult him with your ego and your and your intelligence about what your behavior is going to be. You weren't married. You weren't sitting like against Potiphar's wife like Joseph. You were deciding, and this is the very first greatest sin in the Old Testament. People don't understand it. They decided the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is to decide for yourself without God what is good or what is evil. And when you consult God, you are then transformed from a being that's only capable of evil which is not doing the will of God, to one that is capable of doing the will of God, which is now married to the eternal spirit of the only one who is eternal, the only one who is eternal, is the Creator. And no one else. No one else. Nothing else. That's why your soul is not eternal until it's married here on earth. This is the marriage here on earth. The marriage doesn't occur in heaven. The marriage supper occurs in heaven for those who are admitted to have a ticket. You don't have a ticket. If you haven't submitted, and that means not just us personally, when we go to the voting booth, when we go into war, when we go into business, when we go into our daily life, if we aren't married in every action and every thought, people say, how do you pray? I said, how do you live? You can talk to God, and he'll talk back to you in circumstances, and you can quote scriptures, but ultimately prayer is living with God in you in each decision and each idea. And cross-checking, God, is this what I should do? Praying, if you don't know, say, God, I don't know. God says, good. Now that you don't assume you know, I'll tell you dreams and visions. I'll give you inspiration. I'll even give you business ideas. I'll help you heal your body. I'll help you heal relationships. But what you have to get out of the way for God to do it. And that's what these people didn't want to do. These Hebrews, these Jews, did not want to let God be the Lord of their life. They wanted to figure, God, I don't need you, just like they rejected in the garden. I can decide for myself what's good or evil. And, and Bill, this is not just a problem with Jews. It's a problem with the human heart in general. It's, it's, well, it's I, I call humans the, I call the inhabitants of this planet that are not married to the Most High God the tenth level maggots of Earth. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's what we are. And if we, once we submit to God, you know, just think of it this way. Let's say we don't even talk about religion or God. Let's say mankind leaps off Earth in a thousand years from now. We have a hundred thousand versions of what mankind was, spreading across the cosmos, blowing up stars, controlling the black hole in the center of each galaxy, hitting wars, endless destruction from various factions of evil, using the gods of force and technology to extend lifespans, etc. As I said before, if we had uh, limitless, you know, no biological senescence, and we wiped out aging because of the very darkness of the heart of mankind, very few of us would even live a thousand years like the patriots. Most of uh, the, the patriarchs, most of the people would die of a violent death. You just look better before you died. Well, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, That's you just wait. Right. You wouldn't look old when you died. You, hey, man, he looked really good at 110 when he was blown to pieces. He looked really good before he had a third degree burns and just vaporized into a cloud of ashes. They looked really good before you know such and such a horrible bioweapon was released. Well, Sorry, I, that's reality. Without the Messiah in you. You'll never see the Messiah. That's why there's people like Obama that presume to be a prince of peace and have a messianic complex. They are false prophets, just like the one in the White House right now. And God help us, if he gets a second term, he will likely sign the Oslo Accord. It will partition the state as a Sunni Muslim, and we will be facing the final seven years of terror on this planet, which I believe is literally a form of grace. It's God saying, okay, God didn't send these things on us. We decided we wanted it. We're responsible. And these people that rejected Jesus, they could have, over the next century or so, as the Roman Empire fell apart, they could have taken back their nation and their land, and they wouldn't have been cast all over the place, and the Jews wouldn't have died in the Holocaust. But because they rejected their Messiah, God didn't send the judgment of the Holocaust on them, they sent the judgment on them by rejecting their Messiah. All God did was, was honor their decision to be free of them and let them play their own way. 
I can guarantee you with the actual historical record that the Jews kept themselves when they stayed in covenant with God, they were impervious to any outside nation. Yeah. And when America got rid of preparing the schools and got rid of moments of silence and got rid of, we talked about this last week with Mr. Davi, uh, the actor, you know, Robert Davi sings Sinatra. That's when America started to fall. I call it America. And when I mentioned the first hour that we, that when I stepped off in 1992, 20 years ago in Israel, I knew I was standing on American soil. And when I'm in America, I was standing on Israeli soil because we are the two houses of Israel. And God uses this two houses to say, I'm going to send two scapegoats into the world, these two houses of the nation of Israel, to show you that without me, without the Creator God inspiring mankind to survive, you will not survive. No matter technology and genetics and cybernetics and leaping through wormholes and controlling stars, you will not survive without the Prince of Peace in your hearts to transform you to a higher order being, a being where the spirit of the Creator rules you and not technology or politics or compromise with the truth. Yep. Well, you know, the subtleties of the human mind, Bill, are so deceptive. Our opinions become fixed to the point where we stop thinking. And this can lead to very dangerous errors unless one really is a truth seeker and examines every matter microscopically yep. with an eye focused on undisputed facts and a willingness to live by them. Now, you gave us some really interesting facts here. You mentioned that uh, Messiah must come within 490 years of the decree of Persian King Artaxerxes to restore Jerusalem, but the 490 years had now completed his time, and since the official story given to the people, was Bozai had not come, and therefore became, became necessary to cut out some of the years of the early history so the 490 years from Artaxerxes could be stretched into the future. Can you explain about this? Because it's important people understand what really mean, this all means. Yeah, sure. Well, um, the Messiah was rejected. The time for the Messiah had expired, and so the year count was fiddled to a later date so that they, that they could wipe their hands of, of the matter now and, and let it come later. Right. Uh, perhaps it would be a good thing to spend that's what he got into the, the, that's what it, because it, it's, there's a lot of interesting facts and it, it should reinforce itself in our minds if we understand how they tried to cover up. You don't cover up something unless there's something worth covering up. Exactly, yeah. We're going to get into that on the next show, which is coming up in a couple of weeks' time. I guess we're going to be back uh, on the uh, 18th. Yeah, on the 18th. Two weeks from now. So, yeah, this is important. So, in other words, because they accepted the rejected Messiah, they accepted a, a military geopolitical leader, uh, Jesus Bar Kokhba, who, of course, uh, lost. And, of course, <laughs> you know, you can't engineer the future just because you want to rewrite the book. We don't have editorial uh, rights to do such. No. But it's interesting that these Jewish scholars and scribes thought it was a wise idea to re-engineer the mathematics and the and the the eternal book of the Bible to come into their their political viewpoints, which was deadly. And it wasn't and just it's a benign interesting thing. That because they had, they held a position, people looked up to them and and accepted the, the lies that they put out. And it's the same today is happening all around us today. Right, and those who uh, don't understand what's going on in our politics, in our churches that are now uh, called teaching milk and cookie gospel, they don't understand we're coming to a time of fire where milk and cookies will not get you through this. Yeah. Amazing. When we come back, we'll continue with chapter 29, the hostility toward Yeshua, and much, much more about this rejection. Two weeks from now, thank you very much. Amazing. BeforeUs.com, Jonathan Gray, ancient archaeologist and believer. Back in a moment. We're back tomorrow with Artie Schlanger.